Welcome back to the Global Goal Studio. We're talking about vulnerable populations. Eddie, I just want to bring up a tweet that you put out recently. It said, when I say my disability hasn't held me back, that's all people seem to hear. What's not heard is what comes next, which is this. It's propelled me forward and gifted me the supreme ability to transcend the world rather than my body. It's made me the badass that I am. You have certainly defied the odds with your numerous achievements, Eddie. How are you encouraging others in the disability community and really all communities to transcend a world transfixed by this pandemic? Well, I think that often when we speak about marginalized or vulnerable communities, the tendency is to pathologize these communities as though who they are and the identities that they embody as though those things are wrong and not the world in which they live, right? So my work as an activist is really to push back against that narrative and vulnerable communities are vulnerable because they've been made vulnerable. Um, you know, they've been made to disappear, not just from public view, but from the discourse itself. You know, I think a practical example is the way that we've been speaking about people with disabilities against the backdrop of COVID-19. We've not explicitly named the communities that are bearing the brunt of the pandemic. Uh, when we say people with underlying conditions, we need to name people with disabilities. We need to name the fact that indigenous people, black and brown people in both the global north and the global south are disproportionately affected by the pandemic, both, both by the global health crisis itself but also by the economic fallout of the crisis. So I think it's about really contextualizing this notion of vulnerability and really um, turning our gaze towards the systems and the institutions and the structures within which people need to navigate. Ms. Fleming, as you know, we just discussed the vulnerable populations encompasses so many different groups, the homeless, the disabled, displaced, the sick. From your vantage point at the UN, you're able to survey all of these different vulnerable populations. Does one, uh, does one appear more pressing in its needs than the other? How do world leaders, how are they supposed to prioritize between them? Well, I think, I mean, first I just want to second what Eddie just said about um, it's really, people are made vulnerable, they're not born vulnerable. This, right. you know, and, and what's amazing about um, people who we would put in the categories of the vulnerable. Is there, they're actually just people like you and you and I. It's just a, a question of circumstance. You know, unlucky circumstance in the case of people, you know, caught up in war, for example. Um, and so I, you know, I think, you know, what is the most pressing? It's really difficult to prioritize mm -hmm. um, because there are there are so many different areas of, of, of suffering, but uh, people can't feed themselves. Right. Um, from one day to the next, uh, they were living maybe um, in a you know in a job where whatever they earned that day was what they were feeding their children that night. And um, because of the pandemic, because a secondary, maybe unintended uh, fallout from it, it was that they can no longer feed themselves. And they're people who are actually dying in COVID zones, not from COVID, but from other other circumstances. So, I think um, because this is the this is the you know, acute on top of the acute. Um, I think that this is a priority right now. Let's make sure that the COVID-19 pandemic doesn't have those secondary effects that it was making vulnerable populations even more vulnerable. And at the same time, let's look at, the, at what the COVID-19 has exposed. It has exposed uh, so much, um, you know, vulnerability in the terms of poverty um, in terms of um, you know not unequal access uh, to health care to digital to education so let's go beyond that and and work towards making this better as we go forward we don't want to go back to where we were right, right. also yeah. Ms. Fleming you still have many people who say that as long as you have humanity you're going to have poverty you're going to have inequality so how would you respond to such a cynical point of view 
That's really sad um, because, you know, we actually, in 2015, when the, the world came together and got very enthusiastic about these 17 goals that we call the Sustainable Development Goals, you know, there, there was this vision and this aspiration, and I think this realization it doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to live in an unequal world. We don't have to live in an unjust world if we all um, pitched in together. So I think, you know, this is our aspiration as the United Nations, and we'd like to really work towards that. We, if we don't have a vision, um, if we're not optimistic, and if we don't have hope, then um, we're, we're doomed. Right. It's all about vision and optimism. Melissa, we're going to thank you for that. We're going to take a short break. Andrew, Eddie, uh, please stay with us, and people watching at home as well. You're watching the Global Goals Studio. We'll be right back after this break. Mm -hmm. 